Dando prosseguimento aos trabalhos, agora o painel de número 7, Novos Paradigmas na Educação. Para o painel, sim, será a mediadora, será a professora Ana Carolina Letchevski. Por favor, a senhora Ana Carolina Letchevski. Ana Carolina é graduada em Estatística pela Escola Nacional de Ciências e Estatísticas do Instituto Brasileiro de Geografia e Estatística e Informática pela Pontifícia Universidade Católica do Rio de Janeiro, mestrada em Finanças pelo Departamento de Engenharia de Produção e doutorado em Métodos de Apoio à Decisão pelo Departamento de Engenharia Elétrica, ambos da PUC-Rio. <coughs> Membro do Conselho Consultivo da Revista Ensaio, Avaliação em Políticas Públicas em Educação, entre outras associações de, avaliações, de avaliação mundiais. Atuou como diretora de projetos especiais da Associação Nacional de Políticas e Administração da Educação. Atualmente é professora de Estatística da PUC-Rio e superintendente do setor acadêmico da Fundação Sesgran Rio. Com a palavra, a professora Ana Carolina. Muito obrigada, bom dia. Antes de qualquer coisa, não posso deixar de agradecer ao professor Heitor Gorgolino, ao professor Paulo Gomes, pela organização do evento e pelo convite. Estou aprendendo muita coisa. O nome desse painel me remete a um desafio cujo enfrentamento, sem dúvida nenhuma, evita muitas forças, novos paradigmas na educação, Discutir o futuro da educação é um desafio gigante quando nós temos tantos problemas educacionais para enfrentar no presente. Nós temos um painel composto, eu acredito que seja um italiano e um francês. Vou convidar primeiramente o professor Alberto Zucconi. He is a psychologist, psychotherapist, president of the Person Centered Approach Institute in Italy. Founded with Carl Rogers, Alberto is a member of the Board of Trustees, World Academy of Art and Science, and Secretary General World University Consortium. He has been working internationally for 45 years promoting the application of the person-centered approach in various settings. Olivier Cruzet has a scientific background, a master's degree as an IT engineer, after two years as a system administrator in the third French internet service provider, he developed for 13 years an IT training model and has been for the last five years involved in 42. The IT school founded by Xavier Neil, French telecom tycom, While still making involved the poor learning model of 42, Olivier Cruzet is also promoting evolution in the French education system through various conferences. Thank you very much. So here we are nowadays getting darker and darker, polluted catastrophic results, dramatic. We are a little bit like that bear. Time is running short. We consume more than is available. Now that there is ample scientific evidence that our relationship with ourselves, with others, and all the living things The planet is the main variable influencing all the aspects uh, we call problematic nowadays. It's the Anthropogene time, as one of our member, Paul Krusen, have uh, uh, many years ago nominated this area. So it's of the utmost importance uh, that uh, we realize our need to see and not to be blind, to think and to act as a system, being aware that we cannot just see different square not connected one another. We have to see interdisciplinarily, intersexually, and also cross and interculturally. As uh, 
Albert has said uh, we cannot uh, solve, uh, unfortunately, the problem uh, of today with the level of thinking uh, that has created them, just uh, making us blind. I'm talking about reductionistic uh, thinking that makes us blind. And uh, education is not the only thing, but certainly education uh, is crucial in what is the, the social construction of reality. And uh, it's very evident uh, that we need a paradigm, paradigm change. Uh, and here we have heard uh, so many voices. Also, uh, Ministry of Education, uh, government, uh, I'm very happy to hear uh, more and more that this is a common shared concern. So how are we going to deal effectively with the mounting challenge uh, that are facing us and that uh, we created? And now we have a new player, the so-called fourth industrial revolution. That's another element uh, that could be good news or really bad news, in my opinion. Because uh, the fourth industrial revolution uh, is bringing a, a new barrage of change, uh, new technology, but uh, not only technology, new changes. Uh, is uh, not very clear anymore what is uh, people and uh, what are the physical world. Uh, we live in virtual reality. And uh, the lines uh, between uh, what is uh, uh, the uh, biocycle social aspect uh, are becoming blurred. And even the notion of uh, what is to be human uh, um, are not so clear anymore. So <clears throat> this time, we really cannot afford the, the luxury, not even before, to mismanage uh, this inevitable revolution. And uh, we hoped at uh, the first, the second, and third the revolution that they would bring a just progress. But it's not been so. Promises like DDT, for example, we felt they were God sent, actually, science sent, but uh, it backfired. We were blind uh, that not only DDT will kill unwanted past, that's good, but the DDT continued to do the honest DDT mission and permeate all the life chain. So we find uh, mother milk with DDT trace. Penguin's liver with DDT. And remember the revolution of chemical fertilizer, doubling uh, agriculture crops, great. Unfortunately, the fertilizer don't stop uh, helping us grow crops, permeate because uh, we are a system, and then we find uh, polluted uh, oceans. So, <clears throat> In education, uh, we need to have uh, an education that is based on reality, not of wishful thinking, and uh, that is based uh, on uh, offering people the means, the ways on which uh, they can uh, learn uh, to develop their potentiality. And uh, John Dewey, the famous uh, philosopher and a pedagogist uh, said it already a long time ago, in my opinion, that unfortunately, in the educational system, uh, we have uh, a lot, might be never enough, uh, of teachers, but very, very few facilitators of learning. That's what we need, uh, facilitator of learning. Facilitator learning that uh, would help people to learn and to develop an inner compass, an awareness, a consciousness. And also, we need to be aware that any decision we make, with any choice we make as scientists, there is always value. We are grounded on value. So we are grounded on 
relational politics, relational politics with ourselves, others, and the world, the image of the world that we create. I believe that we have ample scientific evidence that we need and with some variably will help effectively us for a more human and sustainable future and is more awareness, more empathy with all the other fellow human being and living things, and enhance ability to respond. Responsibility usually is understood in a limited moralistic way. You are responsible, meaning you're guilty. Well, maybe there is that too, but that important aspect is to help people to be able to respond effectively to what are their circumstances. So since uh, education is a very important uh, aspect uh, of the social construction of reality, we don't live in reality. We live in the construction of reality. And then uh, we live in the construction of our experience. So education being uh, one of the most important building blocks uh, of uh, society, uh, effective education uh, uh, produce, uh, if it's effective, uh, creativity, resilience, uh, personal and social health, uh, and uh, also prosperity. You know, we still uh, measure with the general national gross product. <laughs> that doesn't measure prosperity at all. So you see education uh, really uh, create, can create uh, problems. Dysfunctional education is a sort of damage in, uh, 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 in you know, variable. And uh, we can see that uh, with the results uh, that uh, we have trained uh, all our pupils that then become uh, opinion makers, decision makers, they become minister, presidents, uh, they become uh, head uh, of a corporation, and uh, we learn. Uh, have uh, construed them uh, as blind. Blind to the consequence of their limited con knowledge uh, informing their action. And so, one of the tools that can help us, uh, certainly one of the many, uh, is uh, what is uh, person or student-centered education. We have uh, about 70 million uh, uh, people being researched uh, going through this kind uh, of student person centered education uh, and uh, we see that some variables are very interesting applies that this kind of education that is a progressive uh, education uh, more scientific grounded knowledge uh, than traditional education and uh, is uh, congruent uh, with the also latest research finding of psychology, sociology, anthropology, and the neuroscience. Also, the research show clearly that it's more effective in helping people learn uh, and be present in school, having a constructive behavior in schools, having a constructive behavior in the community where they live. And it's also more effective than traditional education when used with the dry <laughs> sort of a subject matter topic like chemistry, biology, computer science. And it's also, uh, well, uh, very effective in a long distance education and a hybrid education. Carl Rogers is the person that uh, about 75 years ago started with his group at the University of Chicago to research uh, all of this and formulate uh, this hypothesis. Uh, and uh, he individuated three main aspects, three main aspects that, that he called necessary and sufficient to promote a change. And these are 
experiencing respect, deep respect. For whom? First of all, for ourselves. If I have respect for myself, I can respect you. If I don't have respect of myself, it's very difficult to give somebody else what I do not possess. Then uh, listening, but not listening and just uh, hearing the words. Listening and understanding the other person's experience uh, through the communication, not only verbal. And then uh, the capacity of deep contact, uh, deep contact uh, that we call congruence. Uh, congruence uh, means uh, basically that I experience, I symbolize correctly without distorting or negating. If I am hungry or hungry, I feel I'm hungry. I don't uh, project on somebody else uh, that he's angry with me. Uh, and so it's the capacity for deep contact uh, with another human being if he uh, has a different skin than mine, different sexual orientation than mine, different religion than mine, but it's also the feeling, the capacity of feeling that is a natural aspect of human being to feel towards an animal or a plant that is a living thing, a living organism and resonating with life in myself. Uh, the person-centered education goals are to promote the innate, so it's not creating, but it's fostering what we already are in the evolution of millions of years of life on this planet. So our capacity for creativity and from learning from our experience, if we are not brainwashed by previous paradigms and concepts. And so it promotes the development of all the capacity of human beings and the integration of the individual focusing not only in the student personal growth, but also in the growth of everybody in the learning community. We see a school as a learning community. And there is no point uh, to better education if you concentrate on the students. It would be mechanicistic. You have to consider person, the director, the administration, the staff, the professor. And uh, Gary the other day was mentioning that uh, we're facilitating the change uh, into person, student-centered um, of a small college uh, in coaching. India, and it's uh, really exciting to hear professors that come there and say, I'm a different person. I speak more with my wife. I dedicate uh, three hours a week uh, to voluntary work. I listen more to my students. Of course, also the students are enthusiastic, but uh, part of the faculty or staff uh, says, I was very suspicious of this person-centered stuff. In the beginning, I thought it was baloney. And they say, but I learn from my experience to trust myself. So it's not that we teach people something. We allow the natural quality of humanity to grow and so they grow also as professional. And uh, being part of this process is not teaching them, but is helping them to develop uh, what uh, they have always had. Uh, and now they have a space uh, where freely experiment uh, and develop uh, their, what their inner capacity. So to promote the development of creative and competent member of society, we want uh, to foster their innate capacity to contribute uh, to their community, not inventing anything, helping them to use uh, what they already have. It's a totally different uh, pedagogy. Um, and so, very quickly, uh, the role of the teacher is very different from the traditional teacher. The role of the teacher is uh, a commitment uh, to be facilitate learning and to democratic value. 
to share her or his passion uh, about learning. Because uh, one of the most uh, motivating things uh, for a student, uh, I remember, I was uh, in some uh, uh, topics, uh, one of the best in my class. Why? Because the professor was uh, sharing uh, his passion uh, for learning. I was very bad uh, in uh, other topics, uh, and different topic in every year because the teacher was boring or was a very uh, authoritative and nasty, you know, Zuccotti, don't speak. Uh, <laughs> a kid needs uh, to communicate uh, with his peers. Um, and also a teacher able to relate with trust and respect uh, to his or her student. But we need uh, somebody mentally healthy, so able to relate uh, to herself, uh, her students, uh, a member of the community with the real contact that cannot be faked. And uh, to have the skills of attitude uh, to be a facilitator learning. So also teachers training, uh, you know, I think uh, we have, we can do better than we do in it usually today. Nowadays, uh, just as two months ago, in Italy, we have a, a right-wing uh, government. Uh, they eliminated teachers' training. It was not enough uh, the teachers' training we had, uh, so they eliminate that. Uh, great. Uh, so with a piece of paper, you know how to facilitate learning. And then uh, to be an effective mentor. Because, uh, you know, to really cherish, uh, to see people grow, you know, is a satisfaction, uh, really, if you are in touch. But also, the student learning to take a responsibility, that's very important. And to be responsible to promote uh, your learning. I remember at the University of California, so many, many years ago, you could, uh, talk uh, to a tutor and convince uh, him or her why you wanted to go in uh, Washington, D.C. to learn uh, intercultural thinking. And uh, you, you have to be approved, uh, but I was able to follow my interest uh, around uh, all the U.S. Uh, university looking for that professor. And, but uh, we are in wanting students interested to learn uh, uh, social and personal problem-solving skills. Uh, so really able and wanting to learn how to learn, uh, the discovery. And uh, most important, to learn uh, from mistakes, which is not only imp important, is an aspect of wisdom. We're going to make always mistakes. And if we hide them, if uh, we blame others for our mistake, we're never going to learn anything. I wish a politician uh, would uh, develop uh, this uh, skill. And uh, the students uh, to be willing to cooperate uh, with the social construction of their school, of their learning environment. So, in, a, in other words, uh, to learn uh, to relate uh, with themselves and others uh, with respect, uh, empathy, and congruence. Also, going uh, to end, uh, person-centered and student-centered education is an effective form uh, of peace education. But to what I mean peace? I don't mean uh, just uh, nice word about word peace. That's not enough. To be promoting peace, I have to be able to promote a peaceful relationship with myself, with the different part of myself. We are often at war before than our neighbor with different parts of ourselves, with different needs. How can I be peaceful if uh, I'm not accepting a part of myself, uh, and when I see that part of myself uh, that I project on others, I hate that. And uh, really ending, uh, uh, 
I think uh, that education is a biopsychosocial spiritual learning experience uh, and uh, to more effectively protect and promote a human and environment capital, we have uh, to operate uh, at all these levels, all together. Thank you. Obrigado. That I learned. Professor Alberto, muitíssimo obrigada, que apresentação excelente. Eu sei que nós estamos com um tempo muito curto, mas eu não posso deixar de comentar que tudo que eu assisti aqui foi muito enriquecedor, especialmente porque vai de encontro ao que nós acreditamos, no sentido de que nós trabalhamos muito as múltiplas inteligências e cada vez mais os nossos estudos apontam que se nós conseguimos desenvolver cedo a inteligência interpessoal e a inteligência intrapessoal, a facilidade para desenvolver as demais inteligências ela é cada vez maior. Então, na realidade, eu vou pesquisar um pouco mais sobre o seu trabalho, porque eu acredito que nós temos muito a aprender e acredito que são estudos congruentes. Muito obrigada mais uma vez. Vou passar a palavra para o professor Olivier. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very, everyone for being here today. Thank you for the organizations and uh, special thanks for Heitor and Gary who invited me here. I'm Olivier, I'm the head of pedagogy of uh, School uh, 42. And uh, well, I guess it's time for a practice lab. Um, I will try to explain to you what is 42 and also why I think that it can be an example of digital transformation in education and uh, how uh, hopefully it will be for you an example of, uh, well, a concrete example of a new paradigm of education. So, um, 42, it's an information technology school. Uh, it's located in Paris and it has been created five years ago in 2013. Um, Xavier Niel did create it 42. He's uh, very famous in France. He's a French telecom tycoon, owner of one of the four telecom companies in France. And uh, well, um, he decided to create 42 to train students uh, as an IT professional um, because, uh, well, because we have some small problems actually in France. Um, Usually, France is known as the sixth world economy. Uh, I think that it's a result of a well-negotiated um, industrial revolution uh, 100 years ago. But unfortunately, it's not the case regarding the e-economy. We are at the 25th rank and it's lowering, so we definitely have a problem. It's not only a French problem, actually, it's a European problem. Almost all the country in Europe are facing this uh, lack of IT professional. The European Commission, um, something like six years ago, stated in a report that uh, by 2020, so almost uh, next year, uh, by 2020 there will be a lack of one million professional IT professional all over Europe. So we definitely need to do something about that. When we are thinking about E-economy, well, usually this nice company that are coming to uh, our mind. And uh, Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, Twitter. From my point of view, these companies represent the second stage of IT in companies in the labor market. The first stage was back in the 80s and the 90s, when IT was an automation process for an already existing chain of value inside a company. Before you had some paper files from one desk to another, then you had some floppy disks, and then you have some network connecting people, but it was always the same chain of value, it was the same way of making cash and making business in companies. Just an automation process. But now for the last 20 years, well, with the internet, with the high connectivity, everyone has a smartphone in his pocket, um, well, we are in the second stage. 
IT has a more strategic role inside company. IT can create new business models. Today, with your own smartphone, you can choose the model of shoe you want to buy, the color, maybe the logo you want to print on it, and it's sent directly to the factory who is going to create the shoes for you. So it's a completely new way of making money, of making cash. IT has this new uh, role of a new strategic role in companies. When I'm thinking about education, well, I'm thinking about edX, Coursera, MOOCs in general. But hey, MOOCs are only an automation of what is happening inside a classroom. So maybe MOOCs, it's only the first stage of IT, of digitalization of education. So we need to move forward and to go to the second stage of education, in, uh, of digitalization in education. And this is definitely connected to what we also can see in France. We have a disconnection between public education and the expectation and the needs of the society and of the library market. Today, in a classroom, well, uh, usually it's an individualistic way of learning, and also it's a way of claiming people. When you have the same degree, you usually will answer the same way uh, a problem you have in front of you. Today, in companies, in society, what do you need? Well, you need first collaboration, because usually without collaboration it's not possible to have a competitive product on the market. And also, today, you need some innovation. You need people that think out of the box. It's not possible to have this approach if everyone is answering the same way all the problems are facing. So that's why, from my point of view, education is disconnected from society and the labor market. Xavier Niel, who created 42, was facing both problems. He was facing the lack of IT professional, and he did also, from previous experiments, realize that, well, education cannot fill the gap. Education is not providing the skilled enough people for their own, its own business. So that's why he decided to create 42. Um, here's a nice picture. It's a picture of one of our three computer rooms. We have almost 300 computers there. And in the whole building, it's almost 900 computers. Students spend almost all their time here. And uh, they are experimenting our pedagogical model called peer learning. Right before explaining to you what is peer learning, two important points. When we created 42, we decided to have no degree requirement. Why that? Well, if education, public education is disconnected from society and from the needs of the company, why should I rely on a public degree for my selection process? Today, someone with a French high school degree, I don't know if it has or not talent for IT. It does not reveal IT talent. Also, unfortunately, in France, and it has been stated by the last two PISA reports from the OECD, we have a problem. So there is a strong correlation between poor social background and the difficulty to access to higher education. So we wanted, when creating 42, we wanted to detect IT talent and to select people with a, regardless their school background and regardless their social background. So that's why we decided to have a school completely free for the students. Our selection process is split in two different parts. First, we have online tests. And then students, well, not yet students, candidates, are coming in 42 in our main building for four weeks long selection test. They are spending almost all night and days in 42 to actually taste what is the curriculum. They will taste two things. Do they like 
like IT, do the like, coding, do the like, creating piece of software. This will be the big part of the curriculum. Some of them never code before entering the selection process. So uh, it's possible for them to access and to be admitted in 42, but at some point they need to realize and to figure out if they like this or not. Also, we need to uh, show people what is our peer learning system and if they fit into it, because some people does not fit at all in our pedagogical model. Today, 42 is more than 3,000 students. Well, actually, this slide is a little bit outdated because a week ago we had our new incoming batch and it's near 4,000 right now. 42 is open 24 by 7. And here is our peer learning model. First of all, well, we do not have any lecture. We do not have any teacher. We do not have any online course available for the students. So what are students doing? Well, it's a 100% project-based, hands-on-based curriculum. Our students are facing software development challenge. They need to create piece of software. They need to code to create an actually working software on a computer. To do this, their job will be to collect information, to filter this information, because they can find some true information, false information, irrelevant information, so they need to learn how to filter this. At some point, they will be able to find a solution to their problem. Usually, they can do this alone. They need to collaborate. Collaboration is really the key here. They need to debate with each other. They need to explain, hey, how did you understood this project? Well, I think that I can solve this project this way. No, I think you're wrong. It's something is missing, uh, or maybe this corner case will not be addressed, and you need to change a little bit uh, and to have a different approach. What we want to do here is to create collective intelligence and to have people debating and finding together new hypotheses that no one brought in the first time. This new hypothesis will be tested and probably it will fail. So they will debate again and they will try again and again. It's definitely a try and fail and try again approach. What is happening when the project is over? Well, the students will do some peer evaluations. Each student will tell, okay, my project is over, and then our intranet system will open a rendezvous system. So they can have five, usually it's five different um, defense with other students from the community. Each student will use a rating scale to uh, do the evaluation of your project. Two cases, your project is a failure, then you will need to try this project again. If your project is a success, well, it will unlock the next project or the next projects. Sometimes you have more than one project that is unlocked when uh, you, uh, the previous one is a success. Each student will be able to choose its own path into our gamified uh, curriculum. And also each student will be able to progress at its own pace. Okay, here you have a nice and cryptic um, diagram, I would say. Actually, it's a design and it's a picture that is representing the complete curriculum for the students. Each student know in green the project he already did and succeed. In red, the project, he failed and he will be able to try again. In a uh, little bit difficult probably for you to see the white projects that are the available projects because he uh, got the requirement for this. And the gray one, it's a still locked project because the students do, do not have the requirement to unlock and to access to this project. So at any time, each student will have a complete view of all the different paths that are available. 
we uh, designed the whole curriculum for something like almost three years long, but some students are doing this curriculum more quickly, in one year and a half. Other students, from the beginning, uh, will start to plan their curriculum in five or six years, because, for example, they need a part-time job. To live in Paris, it's expensive, the school is free, but you still need to rent a flat and to eat every day, so uh, some students need a part-time job. Our gamification system includes some experience points, experience point sum-ups, and students uh, go through different levels. Uh, we have uh, 17 skills, we are using a local currency, uh, we have quests, badges, houses, just like in Harry Potter. We have a lot of different uh, gaming uh, classic effects. Um, we decided to have this gamified approach, um, well, at first for a motivation, motivation level. Uh, some of our students are geeks, so they do love playing video games, so it's uh, easy for them to be involved in the curriculum uh, because it just acts like a video game. Also, we have a stigmatization failure in public uh, French education. So we want to legitimate a try and fail approach. And with this video game, it's okay to say that, okay, the first level, I will try two or three times before succeeding the first level. Then I will need to try the second level probably 10 times, and then for the third level, develop a strategy to be able to solve it, and so on. We want to legitimate this approach. All of this uh, pedagogical model is not a five years old pedagogical model. It's actually, it has been actually been developed for 25 years. And the first goal initially was to be close to what is happening in a company. In a company, usually you do not have any teacher. You will need to create actual piece of software to sell them to customer. You need today in a company to collaborate starting from the beginning. I think that there is too much information today available online. And uh, if you want to have a competitive product, you need to have a strong collaboration because not all the needed information can stuck just into one unique brain. It's not possible you need to have a strong collaboration starting from the beginning. And finally, more and more companies are using some peer reviews and flat management. And uh, the first ones that come into my mind is Google, for example, who had for a long time some kind of flat uh, management uh, way of, uh, uh, of working in the company. I'm not a researcher. I'm not a pedagogy specialist. But from time to time, a lot of people told us, hey, you definitely have a social constructivist approach. Of course, I think that our model can be connected by some ways to the work of Jean Piaget, we already mentioned him uh, yesterday and uh, two days ago. Uh, also, Celestin Freno or Maria Montessori. And if you uh, may know Sugata Mitra, um, I think also that his experiment in the slum in New Delhi and also his experiment in UK primary school are pretty close to what we are doing. If you don't know Sugata Mitra, uh, please go and see his famous TED talk uh, 10 years ago, I think. Uh, he's explaining uh, very, uh, very well uh, his experiment and it's very interesting. Um, I've also had some feedbacks um, after some conference. Uh, some people are calling what we are doing natural learning. They are definitely connecting our way of learning on, uh, with um, the way uh, babies are uh, learning how to talk and how to walk. Um, actually, I get that uh, when a baby wants to talk, you don't say to him, please stop. First, I will give you a lecture about gravity and the forces on your leg, and then after you will be able to try to work, but you will need to succeed at the first time, or I will yell at you. So, hopefully it's not happening like this. And um, 
Well, maybe there is some natural way of learning for people, and if we can recreate um, close context to this, maybe it's easier for students to learn. Okay, I'm running a little bit short on time. Um, quickly, some results. Well, so far we have a lot of job and internship offers. We also have very good feedbacks from companies. Uh, they are uh, telling us that we are definitely developing some uh, needed skills for the digital transformation. And before addressing the more specifically the skills, we also have some students that do not complete the curriculum because they have very good job opportunities and they launch their career. And if they are doing this in a sustainable way, it's okay for the us. Our goal is not to have a student that completes the curriculum. Our goal is to have a student launching its own career in a sustainable way. Sustainable is interesting, is important here, because, uh, well, if in 10 years uh, our students are stuck and need to be trained again, we did fail. It's not our goal, actually. Of course, we will develop some technical skills, like artificial intelligence, like security, object-oriented programming, uh, but our real goal is to have people that uh, will be able to adapt during 40 years, during all their career, because IT is evolving very fast. Today, I don't know what I should have inside my curriculum, so it will be okay for my students for the next 40 years. It's not possible to know. In five years, in 10 years, there will be some new languages, there will be some new technology, and students will need to train again. So that's why adaptation, problem solving, collaboration, critical thinking, self-learning, creativity, it's very important to develop actually these skills. I'm lying to my students. They think that they will develop uh, technical skills, but our real goal is here, is to develop an agile state of mind. I'm definitely right. We have a lot of connection with all our ecosystem, meaning companies, meaning startups, meaning other schools. For example, HCE uh, is a French famous business school. Uh, we are doing a lot of conferences and hackathon. Uh, so our students have an open mind about the labor market and the different kind of jobs they can have on the labor market. I won't tell you anything about our Pearl Opera experiment. It's an experiment with uh, unemployed people from uh, almost two years, and we try to train them uh, so they will have the new state of mind of I understand IT in uh, uh, is a new world of IT in companies today. And finally, we have an entry program, so uh, our students who want to create their own company can do this. So I hope that this very short introduction about what is 42 was uh, um, okay for you. I think we offer what is an alternative way of learning, a different way of learning, and I hope that I did convince you that it's uh, probably an example of what can be a digital transformation into education. Thank you very much. Professor, muito obrigada. Estou absolutamente encantada com a apresentação, com o trabalho que é desenvolvido pela instituição. É, não tenho a menor dúvida de que nós precisamos estreitar os caminhos entre as escolas, as universidades e o mercado de trabalho. E a sensação que eu tive assistindo a apresentação é que a 42 já está no futuro, já está oferecendo a educação que a gente pensa, imagina e sonha para o futuro, que na realidade é uma educação para poder atender as necessidades do presente. Muito obrigada, professor. Thank you. Eu gostaria, eu sei que nós estamos com um tempo bem curto, mas eu gostaria de abrir para algumas perguntas, já tem uma inscrição aqui. Thank you very much for two very inspiring talks. The intellect is the uh, coin of exchange in today's education. We need to speak about it on ways to develop the intuition. Uh, I want to ask to the, uh, to the panel, what tools do you think 
we can develop intuitions before the big teacher who is suffering is going to give you his lecture. You are not obliged to answer if, 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 if you are not feel like that. Um, well, we, um, as we do not have any teacher, um, there will not be this bias that a lecture can have a dogmatic effect uh, on the students. Um, we design our curriculum in 42, so um, students will need to reach a goal, and we don't care what path they will use to reach the goal and to solve the one at first technical problem. We want them to develop their own creativity. We we'll always have free space to give some. Um, uh, we always have free space so students can uh, add new features to a piece of code, and. Uh, Hopefully, we will develop that creativity, we will develop this intuition and this capacity of innovation. Um, I think that you may have heard about artificial intelligence that will probably replace a lot of different jobs in the next years. It will be probably one of the last jobs that will be replaced, but at some point, an artificial intelligence also will be able to create a piece of software. So my own students, Maybe they will be create an artificial intelligence that will replace their own job. And what will be the asset of a human being in this context? I think that creativity, being able to create something that is improbable for an artificial intelligence and handle this along with um, connection and uh, human relationship, I think that these two aspects will be uh, the uh, asset of a human being in. Uh, 30, 50 years, maybe. So, yes, intuition is very important, creativity uh, uh, also, yeah. I'd like to thank both Alberto and Olivia for fantastic presentations. And a couple of questions, one to each of you. Uh, Alberto, you're talking in the limited time available about uh, a general approach. But, uh, for example, if you take specific occupation or specific types of technical education, medical, for example, uh, how, uh, how, in, how appropriate this is in a case like this. And for you, Olivia, uh, you've illustrated practically so many of the principles that we've been talking about the last three days, the peer-to-peer, -peer, the active learning, the, uh, the self-paced uh, learning, the uh, learning how to learn. Uh, a couple of questions that come up in my mind. Uh, one is, uh, this, this method presupposes that the student, one, can do certain things on their own, uh, that they're not relying on the instructor. So I'd like to know, you've done a selection process for which students you think will fit in to this program. Uh, obviously, with limited capacity, you have selected those you think would be best. But what is your experience or your, your sense after all of this experience about the capacity of this method to be more widely, less selectively applied to students? If students can learn from each other, if students can learn without the direction of instructors, I'd like to know your intuition about it, if not uh, uh, as to how widely it can be done within the field that you're doing. Second related is, what about, you're talking about a field of knowledge where we can practically see the result in terms of you've got a set of programs, they go through, they have to produce something tangible. Uh, have you any thoughts or has anybody thought about uh, the application of this in other fields that are not as tangible uh, as the programming is. And finally, uh, I, I hoped you would mention at the end, so just tell us a little about what's happened with 42. Is it just in Paris or is it spreading somewhere else? And what do you think can happen in the future? Uh, thank you, Gary. Very quickly, yes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, actually, to the field of health uh, is called person-centered medicine, uh, and uh, we have uh, tons uh, of research uh, proving uh, that uh, when uh, you don't uh, 
label the person that is using uh, the service uh, of the doctor or the medical institution, uh, but uh, you involve that person uh, in a working alliance uh, with uh, the doctor, the nurse, etc. you have uh, in surgery compared less post-surgery complication, less uh, days in the hospital, more uh, immune system strengthening, and in terms of teaching, uh, and it's, for example, in the States, Harvard University, uh, I have a friend uh, <laughs> uh, that has been uh, going all over the world, uh, the Harvard uh, system, uh, and it, many more, don't teach the traditional way, and he's talking about uh, creating socially construction of doctors. But they say, well, for this kind of problem, you know, health problem, please uh, go to the literature and uh, report. And, but is, this is also how we train uh, our clinical psychologists. This is also how the Bologna process, uh, last report, uh, uh, you know, suggest we're doing well, but uh, we could do much better, involving better, more, the students uh, in design the curriculum and in evaluating the results. For, for example, in our school, the HEP in Italy, they are all doctors uh, and clinical psychologists, uh, but when they have the exam in class, uh, they, they don't bring it to us and we correct. They say, now, bring it home uh, and uh, you correct uh, your essay, check in the literature. And then if they have to pass uh, from, uh, one day, from one year to the next, uh, they have to write a self-evaluation of knowing, on uh, doing, and on being, you know, being able to relate. Uh, and uh, they get feedback uh, from every member of the learning community, which means uh, their peers and their professor. The only one that doesn't give feedback is me, because I'm the president, uh, and I have to sign the diploma, and I don't want to give uh, public uh, feedback. So I think, uh, like uh, our friend here, uh, tomorrow is already here. And uh, we always talk about how we can uh, develop uh, creativity. That's the wrong way. That's really wrong uh, to wanting to develop uh, creativity. Let's stop uh, killing creativity. Creativity is part uh, of human nature. And uh, we kill it uh, with the socialization and uh, with the traditional school system. That's my opinion and my research data. And there is a nice TED talk about uh, Sark and Robinson about that, I guess. It's very interesting. Uh, also, uh, uh, you may enjoy this one. Uh, to answer your question, Gary, um, I think that um, we could have a, a, a more students into our, our curriculum. We need to actually make a selection uh, because of logistic issues. Uh, but uh, with more space into our building, I think it will be possible to um, only focus on uh, someone who likes um, coding and likes IT. If all the um, comments I received regarding the fact that we are close to what could be a natural way of learning, well, at some point, everyone should fit into this model, but I'm not an expert for that to have a, uh, a correct opinion, but it's an intuition. Um, today, I think that uh, we could uh, uh, remove a part of our selection process and to have more students, and, but of course, it will take more time for some of them to adapt and to be able to uh, start uh, correctly the, the curriculum. Um, regarding having the same pedagogical model on an other um, topic, well, we have been asked, for example, by HEC, uh, the French Business School, uh, do you think it's possible to have this kind of um, uh, approach for business? Well, uh, it's difficult for us because we build this uh, um, model 
while doing IT, and uh, IT is our main subject, topic subject, but it's also a support for our pedagogical model. So we need to uh, split correctly this, probably with the help of a researcher or something like that, and then to uh, be able to construct a new program and a new curriculum with a specialist in business or in medic, uh, medicals and, and, uh, and so on. So I think that it is possible, uh, especially today, uh, because of a lot of possibilities of um, virtual reality and uh, um, uh, experimentation on a computer. Uh, you can have a try and fail approach if uh, you are um, um, a physics scientist uh, dealing with uh, uh, radiation and nuclear material, but with a simulation maybe it's possible or chemistry exploding because you mix some dangerous uh, components, it will be possible using uh, VR for, for example. And your last question. Um, 42 um, have been created in Paris five years ago, but we also have another campus in uh, San Francisco, Silicon Valley. Uh, we also have uh, eight other campuses and uh, franchise uh, in South Africa, in Ukraine, in Russia, in Netherlands, in Brussels, and soon in Helsinki. And if everything goes well, probably in Sao Paulo uh, next year. And I think I got all the three questions, yes. Eu gostaria de agradecer demais aos dois professores. Infelizmente, eu já recebi dois avisos de que o nosso tempo está esgotado. Nós poderíamos continuar aqui por mais muito tempo. Muito obrigada e parabéns mais uma vez.